Hey friends, thanks for joining us on the Changed Movement channel. Let's get started. We are meeting together this morning with our great friend Roger Gaskin, who is here in Reading. He's got his story and the Changed book, and he's been partnering with Ken and me for a long time. Um, several years ago, before Equipped to Love was formed, the three of us would meet in Ken's office and we would just talk about what happened to us. We kind of found each other and spent every week, just at least an hour or more, mm -hmm. talking about how the Lord had met us. And after about a year of, I mean, just fellowshipping together like that, talking about the nitty gritty, we thought, hmm, we know enough to help other people. And so then that was the beginning of Equipped to Love. And so we're eager to hear from you, Roger. So glad you're here. Um, it's good to be here. If you would you share a little bit of your background? Yeah. Well, um, as Elizabeth said, um, uh, we uh, Ken, Elizabeth, and I started hanging out a while ago. But prior to that, um, I had. Um, uh, I'm trying to sort in my mind how to tell my story in this context. It's always funny doing the Facebook thing right. um, or, or a chat Zoom. Um, so let me let me just start this way. Um, hi, my name is Roger and I struggle with homosexuality. Oh, no. <laughs> um, and uh, so, um, I, I, you know, I, I didn't grow up in the church. I was born into a um uh interesting family um okay and all the distractions so just let me deal with this for just a second let me just be real honest i'm looking at the picture nelson i'm realizing you can see a broom over here that i didn't put away and you can see all the books you get points for authenticity that's right this is just life isn't it this is how yeah, things really happen it. just, just bring it <laughs> so, um, so, so my story is, yeah, so I need, I'm, I'm a wounded housekeeper and that's, this is all about that. Um, so I, I kind of grew up in a, in a home, uh, both parents came from religious backgrounds. As soon as they left their moms and dads, uh, that was the last they went to church. Um, and, and there was some real significant issues in, in, uh, brokenness there. Um, and that was kind of visited on my sisters and I, especially, you know, I know for me, um, uh, there was real uh, difficult relationship with my father and I. Unfortunately, some of his behaviors um, weren't really good, um, were really good for me in that he um, um, uh, engaged in uh, molesting me and that kind of thing. Um, and then uh, probably, you know, as we look at causation and things like that, sometimes we think about what what's the cause, and I, I don't know what is the worst or the most difficult issue. Is it um, when one um, is molested or the rejection that often can happen after that, mm -hmm. and the profound disruption of relationship with with either with with either parent um, or but especially the same sex parent, um, and so. Whether that's causation or what, you know, for me or what, I don't know exactly. Um, uh, that's a difficult thing to determine. What I do know is that um, um, all my life um, I have been, uh, there was that attraction uh, to, same, to the same sex. And um, uh, now I grew up, I'm a little older than Ken Elizabeth. Um, I kind of grew up in a little different situation, just a little, thanks Kim, um, just a little. And uh, uh, so I grew up in a world, that, especially the church, because I came to know the Lord when I was 12. Um, I grew up in a, in, a, in a time period, the church was, while it was in the 70s when I got saved, 1972, um, the church was probably still 1952. Um, so while the sexual revolution, all these things were going on around us, uh, in our real life outside of church, within the church, these are never issues that you would discuss, talk about, or anything. So as a, as a, as a new believer, um, there was no place to talk about that. In fact, I can remember one day in Sunday school, I, I went to Sunday school. Um, funny thing, do we still have Sunday schools now? I guess, I guess we do. Um, can you have kids? Do kids go to Sunday school? 
Uh, well, not recently, but uh, not, not yeah. during COVID. That's right. Oh, that's right. We were yeah. talking about COVID early. That's right. They don't right now. So, um, so I was in Sunday school, and one of the elders came in to tell us about you know you should never masturbate and um, because you're going to die. He literally said that we were going to die, and it's kind of funny because it's taken from an Old Testament situation, um, a story in the Old Testament that that's not what it's about at all. I already read that verse. And I knew, by the way, that I wasn't going to die because, yeah. Um, so, um, so uh, none of that happened. Um, but, uh, but that, but that was the church. Um, it was a place where you couldn't talk about sexual stuff. You couldn't, especially um, homosexuality or um, uh, con conflict, inner conflict with your own sense of identity and gender and uh, the uh, disasso you know, uh, the the disruption of all of that. Uh, the church wasn't a place for that. Um, I went to college. Um, please be impressed. I do have two degrees. And uh, I went to college um, and I have an undergraduate degree in pastoral studies, biblical studies, theology, and a minor in psychology. Um, uh, that's so I could fix myself. And then um, I did that. Um, and it was finally about that time that I was like, oh, I really want to talk to someone about this and see if there's something to be done. Um, and I, I talked to a pastor at the church that I was going to. Now, again, I have, I've always really kind of had very loving, caring responses. I've not been in a situation where anyone ever tried to kick me out or get rid of me or limit my um, uh, 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 giftedness or the expression of my giftedness in the church. Um, uh, I've always had open doors. Um, been highly trusted and, 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 and really treated well. Um, so that I don't have that experience of shun. Um, what I did have was a whole bunch of people who loved me who didn't know how to address it. So they never spoke to the issue again. And I think, um, uh, uh, you know, it'd be interesting to know what some kind of yours, your guys' experience is with that. But that kind of feels like rejection um, because you're, you're inviting people in they may not get that they're being invited in, first of all. And secondly, they're so uncomfortable with the idea, um, uh, what do you do with that? And so they, they, they didn't want to hurt me, so they never talked about it with me, um, yeah. which hurt me. <clears throat> wow. Not intentional, but it hurt me. And um, I interpreted it wrongly for a long time. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm in college, I started, I, First pastor I told, he said, Roger, you just need to date a girl. And I said, thanks. Thank you for that. He didn't realize I had been dating a girl. Um, there were a couple that wanted to marry me. I know I'm a catch. And, uh, uh, and it was funny because I, you know, now I look back and I go, I wasn't just attracted to men. I actually, there was stuff there, you know, like, or, you know, sometimes a woman's femininity calls out to a man's masculinity, even when a man doesn't realize he has masculinity. And That's it was just, good. You know, it was awkward, you know, but I look back and I think, wow, I really was, gosh, I think I was really attracted to them. I just didn't know what that was. Mm -hmm. And I was so focused on my brokenness that I, my, my vision to what was actually whole, I couldn't see it. Mm -hmm. I was so looking at brokenness. And so, um, uh, yeah, that, that wasn't the best um, counsel. I mean, it was good counsel, date, yeah, okay, I'm on a date. Um, but it didn't address uh, what was, um, it, it didn't address the distraction or that thing that was keeping me from flourishing. Mm -hmm. um, and I needed that to be addressed. I needed help to understand. I needed help to walk in greater freedom from, from that. And so um, uh, from like 21 on, I've been involved in church leadership. I've been involved with either planting churches, pastoral ministry, teaching, all sorts of stuff. Um, uh, I was a missionary for a little bit in Russia. Please be impressed. It was cold. Um, and uh, that was a lot of fun. Love going places and doing things like that. Um, uh, came back to the United States, started working as a social worker, got a master's in social work. That's my second degree. And uh, uh, loved actually, yeah, 
thank you. Impressed, be impressed. Um, loved um, doing that stuff. Um, it was actually very good. I'm very good at social work. I'm really good at dealing with crisis. Um, I have real strengths in that area. I, you know, a crisis for me is someone's, you know, is going to die in just imminently. And you, you, you know, if it's not that, it's really not a crisis. It may be something that needs to be addressed, but, you know, if they're going to bleed out in front of you, that's a crisis, um, you know, um, but most other things aren't. And so because I dealt well with that kind of situation, um, I did well in, in social work and it, with uh, Children's Protective Services and that kind of thing in the state of California. All of my life I've, I've worked and then I've also been involved in ministry. Mm -hmm. um, and most of the time, um, uh, well, all the time that I was in ministry, the church leadership always knew what I struggled with. Um, I felt like it was something that should not be hidden just in case um, something happened. And by that, I don't mean my own moral failure because that wasn't something, again, I come from a little older generation where there are taboos that are still in place. It's like, no, you don't do certain things and that's just the way it is. Um, but you still struggle with it and it's in your heart and your mind and you don't know what to do. So um, I had always shared with a church leadership um, that uh, this um, is something I struggle with and um, never really, um, again, they loved me, but didn't know what to do. Um, I, I, I also went to some, uh, a couple of licensed clinical social workers, some therapists, a couple of therapists that were just really good, Melissa and Bonnie that I worked with over the years. And they opened doors, that opened doors for me as I pursued not just spiritual healing, but really dealing with mental health stuff. Because um, sometimes we want just a spiritual answer, but it's not just a spiritual answer. And in fact, if we got rid of our, like if, Sex, if same sex attraction was completely out of my life and gone right now, I would still have plenty of other issues to deal with. Ask Ken and Elizabeth, they know me. And there's other issues that might need to be addressed. Um, but sometimes we get so focused, like I was so focused on, on uh, the spiritual side, Bonnie and Melissa helped me really to see, you know, there's some other issues. And in, in the midst of that, I went to a, a conference with Andy Kaminsky. And I had been involved in Living Waters. I was trained to do Living Waters many years ago. Then I got trained to do it again recently when Ken and Elizabeth and I did that together. Um, but it was an opportunity where um, a, a situation where I, I, I needed healing. And so I was, one of the things that's really smart and it's kind of like a shotgun approach, but frankly, when you go to war, you don't just use your infantry, you use your Navy, you use your Air Force, you use everything you pull in all your resources. It's not just a spiritual issue. It's not just an emotional or a psychological issue. You know, it's all these issues. There is a physiological part of it. And by that, I don't mean that um, I'm genetically, um, a, that homosexuality is genetically caused. I'm saying that behaviorally, we develop neural pathways and there are things that we do uh, behaviorally that create uh, a predisposition uh, and maybe that's that's really the wrong word or concept that that uh, this creates in us um, uh, a, a narrow pathway. It just it patterns of behavior, habitual mm -hmm. behavior that needs to be addressed with. And so I was addressing all of this in the midst of it. I was at an Andy Kaminsky conference. Love Andy. So grateful for him. So grateful for him and Leanne Payne and so many others that have gone before us. But um, um, and in the midst of it, all of a sudden I had all these memories. And it was just like, I don't remember that. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden it was How stuff was there. How old were you then? I was like 33, mm -hmm. 30, somewhere between 31 and 33. And I'm sitting in this conference and Andy's talking away. Not really that good that day, by the way. And I mean, <clears throat> let's just be honest. It wasn't like the, the Holy Spirit was moving and everything. No, it was... I was listening to a guy that was kind of boring that day. And in the midst of it, the Holy Spirit just kind of pulled back some stuff. And, and, and I saw, I remembered being molested by my dad. 
and uh, this stuff was, and I went back to, and, and I was seeing Bonnie, my therapist at that point, and, uh, and she's a lovely Christian woman, uh, good relationship with the Holy Spirit. We were praying and believing and doing therapeutic intervention and all this kind of stuff. And she looked at me, and not about changing homosexuality, but addressing some other issues, um, like systemic, you know, like um, depression and just uh, negative thought patterns, that kind of stuff. Um, and I came back and told her, Bonnie, I, ha I had this experience at, the, at this conference and I think it's false memory syndrome. And she slugged me. I don't think therapists are supposed to slug their patients, by the way, um, but she did. And she looked at me and said, you are smarter than that. This is what we've been praying for and working for that we would have some insight and breakthrough on this. And it was just like, oh, oh, it's real. Okay. And again, that started a whole new journey of looking at things differently and, and trying to understand stuff. Um, and so my journey has been working you know, like with Bonnie and Melissa, that was a, a really excellent. And then uh, uh, beginning to have people in my life that would engage in that. Um, uh, I got to a period of time where um, I wasn't quite certain uh, whether any more growth or change could happen. And um, uh, at, the, at that same time, I um, kind of connected with Bethel. Um, uh, I had dated a young lady. Um, well, she actually wasn't that young, she's my age. But um, uh, she was younger uh, at that time. And uh, we, had, uh, we, we had gotten uh, really close in our relationship. We were looking at, we were looking at marriage. And uh, the truth is, um, uh, th that, pro that was not a wise decision really, not because of same sex attraction, but because our relationship was really dysfunctional. And because there's multiple issues, it's not just same sex attraction that I'm dealing with. It's a lot of other stuff, right? So, um, so what happened was um, uh, the Lord spoke to me and said, go see her. You need to apologize to her for how you treated her at the end of the relationship. And um, I was very obedient. So two years later, I went up to see her and, uh, yeah, sorry. And uh, so I went up to see her and she, um, she was really responsive and forgiving. And I, and we went, she was going to be a Bethel at that time. And the Lord started, um, that was the door to some more stuff. Cause the Lord started speaking to me again about there's more for you. There's more, you can walk in greater freedom and you can actually have a life that flourishes. It, this isn't the end. It's, it isn't just limited. There's more, there's a lot more let's go for it. And in the process, um, uh, that kind of catapulted me to new stuff. And in the, I, I went to Bethel school, Bethel school of supernatural ministry. And I was there for about three weeks. And I was thinking I've left everything to go to a youth group. Oh my gosh, what have I done? Lord, what did you say this for? And he had told me, I wanted to touch something in your foundation. Well, he wanted to give me a whole new foundation. And what happened was I had this profound revelation about three weeks into it, I was just sitting doing my quiet time on a retreat, um, drinking the worst coffee in the world. And, the, and I just finished reading Romans 8, 1 and 2. Therefore, is, there is now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. For through Jesus, the law of the spirit of life. Don't you love that? The law of the spirit of life. He's the spirit of life. The law of the spirit of life has freed us from the law of sin and death. And the Lord spoke to me and said, yeah, you don't really believe this freaked me out, spent about two hours processing that, went to a meeting with my with a friend, his name is Dave Harvey, um, and Dave and I didn't know each other at that time, we had just said hello to each other, and then Dave opened a scripture and said, you know, the Lord spoke to me this morning out of this verse, Romans 8, 1 and 2, and then for 45 minutes, he said exactly what the Holy Spirit and I had been talking about for, for about wow. two hours. and it um, kept that changed everything because that encounter what happened was on one side of my head it was like a rolodex for you old folks it was like a rolodex all these all these scriptures and all these ideas and all this theology and kind of my bad theology that i had developed and on this side the lord was taking those same scriptures and saying, but this is what it means and it was just like oh my gosh i have so misunderstood um, I was a good evangelical. I had good theology. It wasn't that my bad was theology. My theology was bad. It was just wrong. 
You can have great theology and it still can be wrong. Mm -hmm. It can be well reasoned, but it's still not the truth. That's and so, good. so it was, if, for me, it was just like, I must embrace his truth. I must embrace scripture. And then he started bringing to me people like N.T. Wright, Gordon Fee, Douglas Moo, um, uh, Adam Clark for old, you know, a couple hundred, 150 years, 200 years ago. All these guys who, who looked at some of these same scriptures and one of the most important sections of scripture was Romans 7, um, 14 through 25. I can't do what I want to do. And what I don't want to do, I do all the time. I can't change. And the majority of the evangelical world, I was, that was more my world uh, from being in the vineyard. Uh, that was so crucial because most of them actually believe that that's Paul saying, you know, I've just given you a theological truth and there's a heavenly eschatological hope in that. But today it doesn't really work that way. And the way it's really going to work is you don't get to do what you want to do. And you really can't change too much. And you get a little new life, but not that new creation thing like the. And, you know, where he says he's going to give you a new heart, new, you know, and all of this. Ah, we're not quite sure when that happens, but not a lot here. We're in a fallen world. And what the Lord said to me was, no. That's that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying you are a new creation, just like I had in the, just like I wrote in my book, you're a new creation. You have been taken from the kingdom, this evil age, and placed in the kingdom of the son that he loves. And that now as someone, as Romans 6 and 8 say, so clearly you are no longer a slave. Now it was like, okay, how do I live as a free man? That's the challenge, right? The Hebrews left Egypt slaves through the water, through the Red Sea. They came out free men. How long did it take for them to learn how to walk in freedom? And I think wow. that's my endeavor now. My experience now is, do I still struggle with same-sex attraction? Yes, it's still a factor. It's still part of, of my experience. How significant? Not that significant. There are other things I, that actually I need to address. But here's the, here's the crazy thing. I can remember years ago, Kenny and I were in a men's group. Elizabeth wasn't allowed. Um, but Kenny and I <laughs> were in a men's group together. And I can remember one time speaking at that men's group. And I told, uh, you know, there's a couple hundred guys. And I said, you know, I'm kind of mad at God because he's not healing me the way I want him to heal me. I want same-sex attraction to be gone. I never want to be attracted to another man. That's not what he's doing. What he did was he surrounded me with the kind of men that I would have been attracted to. Healthy men, whole men, manly men who loved me and who refused to allow me to stay in a place where I believed lies and I saw myself as something that I wasn't. Some of them, um, uh, I had one guy say, you know, I don't care if you're attracted to me because that's not who you really are. I love the so man. So good. I know. Yeah. And it was like that kind of environment. I was, I, the Lord brought me into that environment to be able to say, hey, this is not your life. Same-sex attraction is not your whole life. It's a part of your life. It's a part, not whole. There's more to you than just that. And we, let's go after that. And this is what I found out. And, you know, I've got a background in mental health. I've got a background in psychology. So this is what the Lord often is doing. He's repairing things. He's, make, he's bringing wholeness to areas in your life that support you being whole in all of your life or being able to flourish in all of your life instead of just trying to address same-sex attraction. In other words, he does things so that when he does this, it's sustainable. It's yeah. whole. It's not white knuckling, right? It's moving after wholeness and flourishing in the entirety of your life. He came to bring life. He came to bring freedom. We never can back away from that. It is, it, it is for freedom that Jesus came to bring us freedom, to set us free. Mm -hmm. what, is, what is freedom? See, we have to look at what is that then? 
Because I think this is what freedom is. Freedom is simply, it's a fair fight. I'm no longer compelled by sin. I'm no longer held in slavery and I must do what it says. No, I've been set free and now I have a choice. I can choose to sin or not. I can choose to, to focus in or fantasize about men or women or cars. Cars is a big issue, sorry. I, I, no, I understand. No, no. Um, I love cars. Um, I can choose to sin, but I don't have to. I've been set free. And so now I'm, like Paul says, put on new life. I love in Galatians where he says, he's talked about the fruit of the flesh. He's talked about the fruit of the spirit and says, now that you live by the spirit, let's keep in step with the spirit. And that's what we're learning to do, right? That's just Indeed. what we're learning. This is me maturing, not just as a guy trying to figure out how to deal with same-sex attraction. This is me as a man learning how to live like a man, a disciple, a follower of Jesus. And that is all of my life, not just a portion. And as he, as he chooses, he gets to choose what he heals and works on. As he does that in us, he sets us up to, for success. He sets us up, sets us up, sets us up. <laughs> Whoops. Um, he you sets know. us up to walk in greater and greater wholeness. You know, was that 10 or 15 minutes? That was gorgeous. Um, I love story, I love story and Bible time with Roger. <laughs> you are so brilliant. And I love the way you in you unfolded that whole theological revelation right into your story. That's so vital for everyone listening. Yeah. Uh, that revelation that you're a new creation and that God is. He's after your flourishing. I love, I love that word. He's after your whole life um, yeah. and, and helping you to flourish. Yeah. Matter of fact, I'm going to be brash enough to say if what Roger was teaching right there didn't jump off and like grab you, you missed it. So go back. I would recommend go back and listen to it again because what he was sharing is the single most transformational thing that I experienced in different ways than Roger, but the same stuff that brought the most freedom in my journey of coming out of LGBT. So brilliant, Roger. So, so well said, powerful. Thank you. Yeah. How do we live in the freedom that Christ died to give us? Yeah. It's so profound. You know, this is, this is discipleship. This, you know, I'm, you know, it's funny. Um, Used to, we, we used to make fun of people. This is terrible. Used to make fun of people. I did. I was evil man. Um, who like were Bible thumpers, you know, and they had a scripture for everything. And, you know, you know why they had a scripture for everything? Because there's scriptures for everything. Now, what you do with it and how you deal with it is, is really issues or is really the issue, you know, um, one of the, the one of the great things about knowing Ken and Elizabeth is I know their stories. And the fun, I mean, the Lord, the Lord has addressed this issue in the three of us three different ways. Right. Because he knows us. He, you know, it's, you know, remember that another story, scripture story. You know that story about Hagar. Abraham kicks her out. And all of a sudden she finds her place with Ishmael. She finds herself with Ishmael. And they don't have water. They don't have, they don't have what they need. And Abraham said, the Lord's going to provide for you. And kicks her out. It's like, ah, I'm not sure that's the best plan the way he did that. But hey, the Lord still redeemed this. We, sometimes what we do is not really the best, the best plan. The Lord redeems it. That's because he's... <laughs> Right. So, but Hagar, and she has this encounter with God. And the thing he says, this is, I see you. He sees us. 
He sees you. So he's seeing you. And he knows exactly the path we need to walk with him. The thing that you, we got to grasp this. This is central. God is good. He is faithful. He's a loving father. And it doesn't matter what your experience is. Those things are true. Yes. Are you going to hold on to truth? We, we, I was, um, I have my alarm set um, on my phone. And what, the way I wake up in the morning is to a song called My Prayer by Dion. Dion in the, in the late 60s uh, was, in the 60s, I think, was a, a, a popular musician. And then in the 70s or the early 80s, he got saved. And then he started, he put out a couple of Christian albums, but he has a song called Prayer. And I was looking for the lyrics because I, I woke up literally with this lyric about, and it's just like, may Jesus, may he just enfold you. May he be the shepherd of all of your life. And basically what, and, and the lyric is, it talks about then me being obedient and submitting to his lordship. And, you know, the, these are concepts that aren't necessarily comfortable for uh, 21st century. Lordship, submission, obedience. These are, submission and obedience are not words that are in vogue, right? These are not, you don't, I haven't heard a lot of sermons lately on those mm -hmm. in the last decades, actually. Um, and, uh, but yet we're called to be submissive, to be sub, to submit, to submit to him. He is Lord. We didn't make him Lord of a life. He always was. We were in rebellion. This is the simple gospel mm. that God the King came and he became a man and he gave his life for us and he resurrected to new life and he invites us now into that new life but he's still king and the way we experience that new life in its fullness is by submitting to his lordship mm -hmm. it's counterintuitive how to be free you want the most amount of freedom be as obedient as you can wow <laughs> so good wow do you think it just doesn't make any sense? It's like in the kingdom of God. I was talking to a lady the, yesterday, and she was saying, "The more I read the scriptures, the more I read books. I, I'm reading about all this stuff. I'm more hungry when I read the book than when I started it." And I said, "Yeah, it's counterintuitive in the kingdom, right? In in the real world, it's supposed to be the more you eat, the more you're full, right? That when you go to dinner, except for Thanksgiving, you you, you know." You're supposed to stop at a certain point because you're full. In the kingdom of God, you go and start eating and you get more hungry and more hungry and more hungry. That's Jesus. He's sweet. It's the sweetness of the Lord. So it's like, so what I would, you know, I want to tell you thing. I want to just suggest to you things and tell you things that are like not necessarily the Oh my gosh, I just wanted to hear him tell me how I needed to be obedient. I needed to be a submit to the Lord's will. I needed to give up my need to identify myself and allow him to do so. Uh, I needed to allow him to tell me what was okay sexually and not okay sexually. I know people, we don't want to hear stuff like that. We want to hear about how, how you be free. This is how, you, this is how you're free. You say yes to Jesus. So good. Uh, you so just say awesome. yes to Jesus. Hmm. He's beautiful. It is. He's worth following. Hmm. He's, you know, he's changed our lives. And he's and there's more. There's always more. When you get to a place where you're 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 kind of feeling like you're trapped or plateaued. It's okay to be plateau for a little while. Sometimes you just have to have, you go through a lot of change and sometimes you just need a, a period of time where it's just like, okay, I just need to live this for a little bit. 
That doesn't mean you've done something wrong and it doesn't mean he's left you. It just means now just live your life for a little while. And he's going to, he's never left you. He's going to stay with you and you're going to move on. I was, I don't know if I say this, but it, it just is so there in my head. So Ken and Elizabeth can, and can correct it after I'm gone. Um, but I, just this idea, I was thinking about this issue of masturbation the other day. And I work with a men's group where that's just no, no, don't do that. But sometimes we make such a big deal of behaviors that we miss the stuff behind it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And don't tell anybody just between the, the three of us, right? Um, right. Yeah. Um, the truth is there's a lot of folks that um, they need to worry a little less about their behavior and just allow Jesus to come and be with them. Mm. They, True. You know, this. I love when Elizabeth talks about after she got that word from that kid and, and what she did after that. Mm. She just wanted to know who Jesus was. You know, the, the truth is we have to seek righteousness. That's not, that's not optional. Mm -hmm. But the, the reality is sometimes we seek righteousness by just seeking him. Yeah. And not yeah, worrying right. about all the other stuff. But let's just seek him. And, and know that, yeah, righteousness precludes immorality. Whether it's same-sex immorality, whether it's heterosexual immorality, immorality is wrong. It's yeah. sinful, not okay. But sometimes instead of trying to change the immorality, you need to heal the stuff underneath it. Mm -hmm. It's the presenting problem. The core problem is something else. Mm -hmm. Yeah healing she's he's so good and he's so kind it's his kindness romans 2 4 right don't you know that it's his kindness that draws us to repentance i i don't need anyone to tell me i sin i'm usually pretty aware of my when i do something stupid <laughs> especially about two in the morning when i wake up and i'm thinking gosh why did i do that that was so stupid and it's usually something I said. Why did I say that? That was so wrong. I was just angry. I got to go clean this up now. Right? Yeah. I don't need someone to tell me all the places I'm wrong. I need someone to tell me, wow, I see the Lord being formed in you. I see his presence in you. You did something yesterday and that was the spirit of the Lord in you, Roger. I need that. That we need, it's like catching one of the best things you can do with children instead of always correcting what they're doing wrong is you catch them doing something right. Because you're gonna get what you focus on. So you tell people, the people that you love and you care for, you look at them and say, wow, that you did that so well. You, you, the way you handled really that, good. oh, that was gold, man. The way you managed that situation, oh, beautiful. That's, you're just, you know, I, I'm, I'm surrounded by a lot of young guys and I just, I just try to always, they don't, they ask me, tell me what I'm doing wrong. Yeah, I don't like doing that. Now, if they really keep pressing me on it, I'll tell them what they're doing wrong. Um, but um, what I like to do is tell them what they're doing right. Because I want them to reproduce that. I want them to focus on that. And the way we do it, one of the, you know, just, it's, it's really just looking at Jesus, pursuing him and allowing him to make changes as he sees fit. Doesn't mean you go sin. No, 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 no. That, don't be stupid. Let's not be stupid. So we get rid of Tinder or Grinder or whatever those things are on people's phones. We get rid of that. Get, yeah. 
no, that's not okay. Sometimes you curl up at night with a pillow and you cry. Sometimes you pray, God, change me, change me, change me. I hate this. Sometimes life sucks. It can be very difficult. It can be lonely. It can be all sorts of things. This is where we, this is the difficulties of just being a disciple. One of the biggest issues was I read, I thought 90%, I thought everything in my world was because I struggled with homosexuality. The truth is, I found out when I started interacting, actually talking honestly with other men and, and I could share what was going on with me, they'd look at me and go, Roger, I, I deal with the same issue. And I found that probably 90, 95% of what I was struggling with was because I was a man, not because I, I struggled with same-sex attraction. The, the struggle with same-sex attraction distorted my relationships with other men so that we could never have those conversations because I was too afraid to have them. Mm -hmm. And many yeah. of them were too afraid to have them with me. Yeah. Wow. Most of our stuff is common. It's, we're all struggling with that. And then there's some stuff that's uniquely to same-sex attraction struggle or transgenderism, that struggle. Some of that is, it's, it's just that specific stuff. But the majority of it is, we're so, our lives are so compartmentalized that we just see it as this instead of, oh, actually, I'm just a human being. I'm just no, a man. That's, that's right. it. Discovering that you're just a man. You're, you're a man like other men or a woman like other yeah. women. That's so essential. Do you think, do you, think you could um, pray over our group who's listening right now and just kind of release some of your revelation to all of us? Sure. Yeah. So, you know, before I pray, I just want to say this one thing. Holy Spirit is with you. He's in you. He's for you. The truth is he doesn't want to make, you know, the church, the church, sometimes we make, we have hoops that people have to jump through. We have things you have to do, all this kind of stuff. Humans do that. We, we do that. The, the father is not trying to make things difficult for you. That's not who he is. It's his kindness that draws us. And so as we come to him, I just want you to come to him. I want you to overlay. If you need to, write it down. If you need to say it to yourself out loud 50 times a day, do it 50 times a day. God is good. He's a good, loving father to me. Mm -hmm. To me. He's good to me. Because he's with you and he loves you. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world. Across that world, write your name. And it's in that context. That is the context we come to him. He loves us. He's given his life for us. He's pouring himself into us. He doesn't find anything about you repulsive. He loves all of you. And he's going to transform you. So Holy Spirit, I pray. First of all, thank you, Holy Spirit. Jesus, thank you. Father, thank you for your kindness and your goodness. Thank you that Nothing kept you from redeeming me. And nothing has kept you, no matter how cantankerous or difficult I can be at times. Nothing has caused you to leave me. Nothing, because you love me. You will not separate yourself. Your love will not separate from me. So, Lord, I pray for a revelation, an insight, an awareness that when we came to Jesus, we became a new creation in that moment. I pray, Lord Jesus, that, that the, the sense of that, the awareness of that, 
that when we read that verse, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, the old is gone, the new has come, your new creation. Verse 16, we no longer assess people according to this world or, this, or the flesh. I pray, Father, that that revelation of how you see us and who we now are that that, Lord Jesus, would propel us to greater and greater freedom. The truth, Lord. I pray for a revelation of truth, that the scriptures become life-giving. That there aren't clobber scriptures, but there are. There are scriptures that bring truth and life. And so I pray, I pray for revelation on the truth of We've been freed from sin. The truth that we now are in Christ and therefore live in Jesus. We live in the spirit. Now that we live in the spirit, now let us walk in the spirit. Holy Spirit, come. Teach us. Teach us. Train us. Speak to us. Show us. And more than anything, may you have, I pray, especially now, Thanksgiving and Christmas, best time of the year, that your heart would be filled with thanksgiving. I pray that there would be a revelation of gratitude, that you would just constantly be in awe and, and just amazed with how good and how kind and how wonderful God is and how much he is for you, and that you would see in Christmas, for God so loved the world that he sent his son Oh my gosh, that you would have such a revelation of the love of the Father that he's drawing you to bring healing to wholeness that you could flourish. You'd have real life, whole relationships. The Lord bless you. The Lord bless you. He is for you. Amen. 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 I just want to pray over you really quick, Roger. Um, Father, we, we thank you for Roger. Thank you for the revelation yes. you've given him, for the, for the teaching gift and the father anointing that he has. Thank you that he's a leader among men. Father, we just pray for favor and prosperity over his life. Mm -hmm. And Lord, we bless him. Thank you so much for him. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for watching. For more info, head over to our website, listen to our podcast, or find us on social media. And remember, change is possible.